When I hear the word anger, um, when I hear the word anger, I, I, it, I immediately jump to different events in my life. Like when I, when I say the word anger, I think of one person, me. Like the battle I had growing up with anger. When I say the word anger, I just make connections in my mind with some of the terrible consequences of anger. I can taste memories uh, in vivid color. You know, I, can, I, I literally can think of times and, and feel my heartbeat racing faster and how I was breathing heavier and what, you know, um, because um, there was a time in my life, apart from the wonderful grace of God, where I had a powerful temper uh and i can think of moments of rage in my childhood that uh also went into my teenage years i can i can think of t- uh times where my mother would say like I, and i don't i'm not being dramatic i just remember you saying that you know we weren't yet believers perhaps not or whether we were going they were on their religious journey and i had had a a just explosive you know, temper tantrum, and she came in the room to see me, and literally, I was asleep, but as I was sleeping, I was kind of just, you know, and she just literally thought, you know, is my son demon possessed? You know, what what is it with him? Even before we were believers, I'm thankful for parents who were alerting me to the grave potential danger of my anger and temper. And that's even before we were believers, just I'm grateful that I had moral, God-fearing parents, and I can remember my dad sitting me down. I can still see that you know, him sitting me down and saying to me, Vincent, you better never you know, drink and get drunk when you're older because you're going to end up in prison someday And you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to say, how did I get here? And they're going to tell you, you killed a man last night. Or you did not because I was powerful, but because, you know, I would have probably just taken it to such an extent of whatever I needed, right? But I can remember my dad, whether he thought he was being overdramatic to make a point or not, I remember him talking to me about, Vincent, if you don't get control of this anger of yours... It is going to destroy your life. Chuck Swindoll in his book shares about a real life situation like that. He says, I sat in the Orange County Jail with a young father, his face buried in his hands. Tears ran through his fingers as he told me of his temper. He had just killed his infant daughter with his own hands in an uncontrollable rage because of her crying. So, so that's real life, right? Anger injures people and relationships. Anger robs our testimonies. Thomas Jefferson was a practical man and he wrote down things to himself. He said, when angry, count to ten before you speak. If very angry, count to 100. I I, I don't know whether that worked for him or not. We're going to hopefully go a little bit deeper than that tonight, right, with as we look at anger. Paul says to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. What is anger? We probably nobody asks that because we all know what it is. We all know when we've experienced it, right? But in any case, the dictionary says anger is a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. Another writer says anger is an emotional reaction of hostility that brings personal displeasure 
Paul uses some words in there when he speaks about let all bitterness and wrath and anger, you know, malice. He's, he, he's using words that kind of are giving us a full picture, but we also know, you know, there, is kind, there are kind of phases of anger. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not saying, I'm never somebody who says these are the five phases because it's all right if you say there are seven, right? Or, you know, Rod's in a field of, of so much, you know, you know, you know, learning a lot of different views and whatnot. And you can have people give you the seven, you know, steps to this and somebody else gives you the eight steps and neither of them are from the Holy Spirit per se. But if we're going to divide them, one view I was reading that I thought made sense was you know, the first phase of anger is, is mild irritation, right? So a mild irritation that's brought about by someone or something. Now that thing may be the kitchen cabinet, you know, that I strike with my own toe, right? You know, and we decide, therefore, somehow we're angry at the kitchen cabinet, right? And begin to, you know, but, but my point is mild irritation brought about by something or someone. So we, we can experience that, right? The next phase of anger can be indignation, right? What happened? Kind of similar as last week when we were looking at misunderstanding. It starts with maybe an innocent act by someone and then turns into a, you know, we turn it into an offense that gets harder, you know. But, but mild irritation that's brought about by something or someone. The second thing, indignation, and, and you know, and I, 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 you know, that must be answered or avenged. And I can see why, as a young person, I struggled a lot with, you know, I, I was a happy kid, but I also had a sense of justice, as I see it, right. <laughs> And, and there, I remember times my dad saying, Vince, you'd be a good lawyer, but you're, you know, but the fact is, no, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, but justice. And so as I saw justice, I've told you this, but I, I don't, t- I, I say it as a joke, but I meant it as real life. The referees were all against the Eagles. The evidence was overwhelming. It was clear to see. They wanted the Cowboys to win. They didn't want the Eagles to win. You know what I mean? So that was my view of justice. And I could, you know, the only one time in my life have I ever heard cannot leap as a penalty. When, Ra- when Carmichael leapt over a, a cowboy, I never heard a ref call cannot leap. That's a, no, I'm, I, I'm diverting. I'm sorry. I'm getting off here. Back, back, you know. But, my, but, you know, that sense of a mild irritation becoming what? This indignation that there must be something answered. It must be something avenged. Moves to a third stage, and Paul uses that word in there, wrath, which then becomes, now you may define it different, but then an expression of it. So we could be irritated, right? And we could feel indignation that this, what someone or something did to me, and we may be absolutely right. It was not right. It was, un, you know, mistreatment, like we're looking at it at First Peter, unfair. And, but nobody may ever know that we're at the stage of irritation or indignation. It may still just be hidden until we get to wrath. And we say, oh, well, okay, you know, kind of now, right? It, it, now, it now comes out, right? This, this wrath, this expression of anger. The fourth thing being, and again, you don't have to agree with this, but the fourth stage phase being fury, which adds now some violence and loss of emotional control. And the fifth phase being rage, you know, a a, a complete loss of control, right? Rage, where if you're in an institutional setting, that's when they're looking to strap you down and stick the needle in your arm or whatever whatever it, it, it may be, right? There's there's a complete loss of control. And rage, we know it's real. We know that their defense attorneys will use it because it's real. It, it, it really is a defense. I'm not saying it's excusable. But there are defense attorneys who will really say, Your Honor, you cannot convict them of this first degree because it was, it was an act of rage. 
They literally had no thought of what they were doing. And so you can't, you can't base it with, as, with this, as the person who, you know, maps it all out and waits for the person and sits there. It, it's, it's a real response. Now, I'm not, not excusing it. What I'm saying is you may have experienced that growing up, you know, it's, maybe that's the way what you saw from somebody or, may, you know, you may have experienced it on the road, road rage, right? Or, you know, we hear about things like that. We hear about, you know, somebody that doesn't even know the other person getting a gun out of their car and shooting them on the highway. Well, it began with a mild irritation. That has to be, you know, and so then they cut them off and then the person gets in front of them, hits their brakes, and now there's some, you know, and it's just on and on and on. I can remember a specific example in my own life as a believer, and I've shared it before, but, a, you know, the, one of those moments that really made me realize, you know, they're better, I, I better find some way to change. Because, you know, I was, a, a, I guess, a sophomore, or maybe, I don't think I was a junior in high school, I'm not sure, but playing in the church basketball league, and I play, happy for the game, I'm friends with everybody. Hey, I, well, I love Jesus, and I did. I, did, I really did love Jesus, but during the game, had a particular guy whacking at my arm, little mild irritation starting to develop, I'm looking at the referee, right, you know, and that, as it continues, it developed into indignation, right, this needs to be dealt with, ref, why are you not dealing with this going on? Ultimately, it came out in wrath, where at one point when I got knocked over and there was no call, and I just screamed at the ref of what a terrible job he was doing, and I got a technical foul, but it was still brewing, still brewing, brewing to a point as this is all going on, and this is all so unfair, and I'm just, you know, and, I, and so that when I called a timeout, and the guy on the other team tried to steal the ball from me, and intentionally, I believe, kind of threw an elbow into my back as he went for the steal. Ref blows the whistle. He gives a little push off. I turned around now at what I would say was fury, and boom, I hit him, right? And now as I hit him, the referee grabs me, and as the ref grabs me and throws me out of the game, the whole other team starts mocking me. Now it went from fury to rage because I can remember. Oh, fight y'all. Come on out. Carry one in on screen. And I remember my brother Leo, because he was just physically imposing on me, grabbing me, holding me on the bench, grabbing my face with his hands, and I'm still going, You guys, I'll take you. And just Leo, I can still see his face saying, Vincent, you look like a fool. And boy, did those words land on me. You look like a fool. Whew. But it was what? I didn't start out that way. You know, I, I don't know how, I, 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 I don't know how it happened. I, I just gave the thing of how it happened. But I, you know, I could tell you before the game, I honestly probably was on the bench going, Lord, let me honor you on the court today. But I didn't, right? And I realized that what a horrendous display by the grace of God he turned me around some of that had to do with me simply going to everybody on my team before the game and saying if you see me getting upset at all pull me up pull me away like you, I need you to hold me account right doing some of those things but I mean it, 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 it was that point and you know what years later I met a girl at college who was cheering for that other team and as we became friends she was like I cannot believe we're friends. I may have told you this before, but she said, I can't believe we're friends. We thought you were a nut. We, we thought you were just a lunatic, the way you, you, your temper would be. And I said to her, I can't blame you. If that's all you got to know me was there and not the other days of the week when I was you know, a little more, right? Now, I don't say it as like, a fun, I was ashamed. Like, I remember going into games after that, seeing people and thinking, oh. Everybody's looking at me. They all know what, you know, what I did last. I remember carrying the shame, but, but you can see how it happens, how it all explodes. Well, 
a, we, we, we want to, I, I, I got to be careful, I'm getting it, losing my track of time here, but we want to be able to look at um, a, a verse of scripture right there in Ephesians 4, that it's a key passage just for some insight into anger, because we want to stay balanced on a whole picture of anger. Because in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, we read, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Interesting, how, that, that, that verse, right? The Amplified Bible says, When angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or indignation last until the sun goes down. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him. Another translation says, if you are angry, do not let your anger lead you into sin. Do not let sunset find you still nursing it. Leave no loophole for the devil. Now, when we read these verses, we don't want to emphasize them too much because our sin nature likes these verses in one sense because it's saying I, I can be righteous anger and we are going to see there are opportunities for that but he says be angry and yet do not sin the fact is it's that Paul would seem to be saying that anger is a God-given emotion right in some ways you may have so, been married to somebody and you kind of felt like do you ever get angry about anything do you see that there are kids out you know you know throwing rocks through our window and it doesn't bother you would you please get angry about something right you know it, but uh, th that our emotions are given to us by god and we have to be careful whenever we talk about that because uh, like all of our being they have been you know distorted by the fall and by sin so we're not guided by our emotions, we're guided by truth, by the Holy Spirit. But anger, Paul would seem to be saying when he says, be angry and yet do not sin, that anger is a God-given emotion. It would seem that Paul is saying, therefore, that not every expression of anger, now it's careful when we think about how we express it, but not every expression of anger or is, is wrong. Now, we know that's true for God, right? I mean, 18 times or more, we read in the Old Testament, the anger of the Lord, the anger of the Lord. And again, and again, I want to go off of this, but we always have to be careful because when we hear the anger of the Lord, we can be tempted to take it the way and, and apply it like ourselves, right? And we know we get angry, and it's, for us, it's a, a response where from the Lord, it's 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 this, you know, we're talking about the righteous, perfect God whose anger is determined from within Him, it, you're, right? He's never threatened, so He's never angry because He's threatened. He's never, you know, so the anger of the Lord righteously proceeds from Him it, uh, toward uh, certain things. Um, Jesus, of course, when He was talking to the hypocrite, it certainly wouldn't seem that he was going, well, you know, you guys, I, I don't want you to take this the wrong way when I say you're, you're whitewashed sepulchers. I hope that doesn't hurt your feelings. Like, no, Jesus, Jesus said it, no doubt, with a righteous anger. I think, to me at least, when we read this passage, though, our focus shouldn't be on, see that? See that? I'm allowed to be angry as much as it should be on the safeguards that Paul gives us. Do not sin, right? Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. This, uh, when he, Remember, for them, their day, sundown was the end of their day. So, so when Paul's saying, don't let the sun go down upon your anger, he's, you know, for us, we... Thanks to electricity and whatnot, you know, no, we, we may be able to say, okay, well, I still got until 11 o'clock before I have to really resolve this, you know, but, but, but he's saying, don't let the day end with your unresolved anger. It's, it's, it, 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 it is not healthy for us. Why? 
because it can give the devil an opportunity. So he says, don't give the devil an opportunity. The unchecked anger gives an open door to Satan. So, you know, it's those are the like to me when I look at we're going to look at a couple things of justified anger. But when I look at that verse, I'm not putting the most of my weight on the be angry part. I'm putting my weight on don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. In certain occasions where our grown children come in after we do, we're in bed at night, I get up in the morning, we go downstairs, the whole house was left unlocked, right? And, and, I'm, and I kind of like, all right, you know, I know I always tell them that I think maple shade's really safe and all, but we still have locks to lock the door, right? Like, don't, don't leave us open, you know, in, in, in that regard. And it's what Paul's saying, don't leave yourself open to Satan, right, to, to what he can do now are there times of justified anger i'm going to state two Uh, one is when god's word and his will are knowingly disobeyed by his people right god makes that clear at times or god's when god's word and his will are knowingly disobeyed by his people certainly scripture will tell us at times that god's anger right burned against them because of their their just willingness to just completely disregard him. If you look at 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 Kings chapter 11, we see there, 1 Kings chapter 11, and um, Solomon, you know, has all these ungodly, wives or i'm not blaming them he has all these relationships with women he's not supposed to be with because the lord had said you shall not associate with them and yet in verse three solomon had 300 wives excuse me 700 wives princesses 300 concubines his wives turned his heart away for when solomon was old his wives turned his heart away after other gods and his heart was not wholly devoted to the lord his god What's God's response in verse 9? Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel. All right? God righteously is that way. I look at an example in the Old Testament, and you may, you know, I, you know there may be different feelings on it, but Moses comes and he sees them worshiping the calf, right? And what does Moses do? I believe in righteous anger. In righteous anger, he, you know, those tablets get thrown down. But this, it, it, I don't believe it was Moses, and we'll see this under unjustified anger. I don't believe it was Moses saying, you people, you, you really hurt my feelings. No, I believe it was Moses saying, this, this, I was just in the presence of God. This ungodly response and this righteous response of anger. So I believe there is justified anger when God's word and his will are knowingly disobeyed by his people. And also when evil attacks innocent, right? Um, In Isaiah, Isaiah says, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel 12 because you're going to see that example out of David's life, 2 Samuel 12. But um, Isaiah says, in a Isaiah chapter 5, he, he speaks about the anger of the Lord being against um, those who take from the weak, right? That, that, you know, taking from the weak. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we see an example of that, right? David has sinned. Nathan is coming to confront David, but he comes with a story. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we read in verse 1, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. 
Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare the, for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. Now, Nathan never says to David, David, you shouldn't be getting angry. David's anger, in a sense, is justified. David is saying, to have someone with that evil heart take advantage of someone weak and innocent, that causes me anger. And so it may be inside of you that... You know, I, I'm, I'm going to grab just one illustration, but it may be inside of you, you think about an abortion doctor who is making millions of dollars, and he knows. Listen, we know a lot of people in our country are deceived. We know that. What I mean is a lot of young women are brought in, oh, it's not a child, it's not a child yet, don't you? And I'm not, I'm not, I don't want anybody to think, oh, he's, he's letting people off the hook. The point I'm making is, for me in my heart, I'm looking at a doctor who has studied life and that doctor knows what that child is in the womb and exactly what he's doing to it. And it makes me angry. Right? It, the anger of this innocent child that this doctor is well aware of what he's doing. Okay? And, and, and so we, 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 we read that. Of course, David's problem, and this is where we... We're going to see how we have to be careful with anger. David's ready to be angry, but it's about him, <laughs> right? And so what I want to say is that we, we have to be careful with anger because we want to say, I feel a justified anger, and look, and we may want to say, look at Jesus when he turned over the tables and this and that, and we have to remember Jesus never misunderstood somebody's motives. He was perfect in understanding motives he never got the facts wrong he never was responding out of his own wrong attitude right so when we want to look to jesus sometimes as our example we have to be careful here's david in what i would consider a righteous anger and yet his anger is coming up in an area that he's blind to in his own life and so i may be exploding in anger to somebody else about something that I'm doing to this person, <laughs> you know, which is what David is happening, right? So unjustified anger. What are, what, what, what are the, is the unjustified anger, which is what I would tend to say is what we struggle with more, right? First, when anger comes from a wrong motive. If you look at Luke chapter 15, we see a perfect example of that. Luke chapter 15, I have no doubt that the older brother in the story of the prodigal son thought that he was experiencing justified anger. You know, or I, I say no doubt, I don't know for sure, but, but he may have certainly felt justified, right? And yet his anger, and I know it's a story, I know that Jesus is telling a parable, and so I don't know whether this was a parable where Jesus is drawing from something he really is, is, was really true, like he watched this happen in life and he's sharing it as a story, or whether he's just making up the story. And so we're, not, we're talking about somebody in a parable. But what happens in Luke chapter 15, we read after the son's prodigal son has come home and they're celebrating him and this wonderful story of grace and forgiveness and just incredible, you know, it, that's, that's built on, you, you know, conviction and contrition, right? This isn't just a, a, a father who's just, it's a, you know, it's not a picture of love that just gives, you know, the, the, it, 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 out, you know, casting pearl before the swine, so to speak, just out there. This, this son repents of his sin, comes back, this incredible forgiveness, and yet we read in verse 28, about the older brother. He comes in and says, what's going on? What's all the dancing? What did I miss? Right? They tell him what happened. Verse 28, but he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. 
But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, uh, you know, again, that's an interesting statement right there. I don't know if you've heard this before, but we don't read elsewhere that, that you know, again, I, I don't want to read too much into a parable, but, but we don't read earlier in the story that he was with prostitutes. So, it, you know, this may be the older son just adding to it. Yeah, let me tell you, I know what he did. You know, adding to the story, right? You killed the fatted calf for him. This anger, this anger. Anger built on what? A je- jealous motive. Think about the anger sometimes from a prideful motive. Nebuchadnezzar builds that statue. Everybody's going to sing praises to me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't. I'll give you another chance, right? And, but, but you're going to all praise me because I'm the great Nebuchadnezzar, and they don't. And it says what? Nebuchadnezzar burns with anger, right? How dare you? you know, unjustified anger. One of the ways is when anger comes from our wrong motive. And that's why I say to you, I don't, I don't put a lot of my weight on be angry as much as I do on sin not. I, I, I mean, be angry. Paul says those words, but on the sin not, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Why? Because I know I'm not always the greatest judge of my own motive. I'm not. I... I try to be honest and say, Lord, give me a discernment and uh, make sure um, is my motive pure. But I'm not always the greatest judge of what is my motive. And when anger comes out of a wrong motive, um, you know, uh, we're, we're, we may not be seeing things right. My motive may not be pure. And so uh, it should be very rare when I'm saying, oh, yeah, well, Jesus, I'm just doing what Jesus did. His motives were always perfect and pure. Unjustified anger, a second one, when things don't go your way. I enjoyed reading on Facebook Christine's kind of words about the, the, the Jonah thing, because, boy, is that a perfect example. I'm a, I figure you, that's what you would be thinking of. When things don't go your way, right? Jonah, if you look at Jonah chapter um, 4, Jonah, as he as we read about, his experience with anger, right? Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, if you're in that area. But Jonah had some real prejudice. Now you may say the prejudice, he may even say, my prejudice is rooted in righteous anger because of how wicked the Ninevites were. I have such an anger at their wickedness. That, but, but the problem is uh, God is going to save them. This is an amazing moment. According to some you know, historians, a half million people respond in faith to God. I mean, think about that. You know, we, we think about like the day after Pentecost, 3,000 God saves, and this one, the, the, you know, some historians would say there were a half million people in Nineveh, and they all respond to God. This is an amazing moment in the plan of God. Angels are, ah, oh, the music is playing. A half million people have repented of their sin humbly before God. And in chapter 4 and verse 1, it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. <laughs> right? And I. I don't have any problem applying this to me in verse 4. And the Lord said, Vincent, do you have good reason to be angry? The Lord, the ref. Vincent, do you have good reason to be angry? Is it the fact that the referee wasn't perfect according to your standards of justice? Is that a good reason to be angry, right? Do, Do you have a good reason to be angry? God says it to him again, right, Um, in verse 9 when, you know, he's just angry. And now now, now at least I have my plant over here, just me and my plant, right? And God, you know, the plant dries up. 
And man, now, now he's just... And verse 9, then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Right? God's saying, do you? you know, so the point this, when things don't go our way, boy, that's where people get to see our Christianity, right? Things don't go our way and we, you know, we, boy, we can just lose our testimony there at work or wherever it may be when our anger just explodes out, you know, when things didn't go our way. I got to hurry along, but a third thing for unjustified anger, when we react too quickly without the facts, right? I've been there where I'm ready to, you know, you know, respond, and I realize, uh, you know what, that's, I, I got the wrong facts, and I'd been better off listening to James chapter 1, where he says, be slow to anger, right? Because I moved too fast on it. And so, unjustified anger, there's numerous ways it comes out. Victories over anger, if it's something that we battle with. Now, I'm not as much focused on tonight um, if you are the victim of somebody's anger. We'll deal with that in another time when we speak about, you know, when you are mistreated, victimized. I'm dealing more with victories over our anger. And four simple things, not simple, just clear. One, ignore small offenses if, if you can. And I say if you can, because we'll see as we move on in here. Scripture calls us to, to that, uh, uh, that, that ability, that, that love, right? That uh, it's a glory, right, to overlook an offense if you can, right? I've shared this before in you know, in some of my premarital counseling, when I'm talking to couples, I like to sometimes share with them my own stumbles, right? And I can, and I remember one occasion, you know, where I um, one I, I and I, I'm going to share this, honey, because Greta, I I this is a disclaimer, but not because she won't be upset with me. It's a disclaimer of absolute fact. She takes great care of things. And I don't, didn't always, I learned to take better care of things. And earlier in our marriage, there was a, it was a day when I went out in the morning to go to work, and Greta had driven the car the night before, and the windows were not completely up. And when I got in the car, it had rained at night, and there was some water on the seats. And I remember saying, you know, Lord, I have an amazing wife. She's so good. She's never going to know about this. Um, but but I, I, this is between you and me, and she'll never know. And I got a towel, and I sat it on the seat, and I just drove to work. What a wonderful husband I am. My wife is never going to know this. When I got home that day, and she, it wasn't nothing. She just said, hey, honey, can you, can you, you know, I, I, I just, I, you know, I was outside today. You left a hammer and a screwdriver out in the rain in the yard last night. And I went, oh, yeah, you left the car window open or whatever. <laughs> you may not remember it, but I remember, I remember coming back with it. And I could still see her, I could see her face because I'm so ha- Her face kind of was like, in a nice way. Oh, really? I, like, oh, you had that one kind of tucked away in the pocket or something. <laughs> you know? And in my mind, I was like, Wow. That was supposed to be one that I had, that was supposed to be something that I was, I got, you know, that was never supposed to be spoken, right? You know, and so, so if you can ignore the small offense, ignore the small offense. Don't let that little irritation become indignation that has to be responded to. A second thing, don't, how, how do I word it the right way? Don't. Uh, draw upon anger-prone people. Now, the reality is you may not be able to withdraw from a relationship with an anger-prone person. But if that's the case, you have to find ways, if they're not, if, if, if they're bringing you into their fold, you've got to find a way out of that. 
uh, you know, it, it, it may be you're drawing them, which is great. But we, we need to be careful. What does Proverbs say? Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. I want to be careful when I say this because I'm glad that everybody didn't say when they saw my temper, let's nobody be friends with him anymore. I'm glad they didn't say that because it would have made me angry. <laughs> No, but in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 24, do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. And I think that's what's being emphasized more. Be careful if you're hanging around with a guy or a group who are always getting angry, always getting in fights. You're going to be pulled down that road. Certainly, What's another response out of Proverbs chapter 15? Proverbs chapter 15, and boy, I've, I've taught a long time tonight, I know. But Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1 says what? A gentle answer turns away wrath. Keep check of your tongue. Keep check of your tongue. Ignore small offenses. Don't be drawn in to anger-prone people. Keep check of your tongue. I talked with somebody in our church today, and as I was meeting with them and talking with them, they they told me about a situation they were in, and they told me how they responded, and I stopped them. I said, hey, let me tell you, great job. Great job the way you responded to that, because I'm sure it changed the disposition of the person you were dealing with, and the person said to me, it did. I said, right, because keep check of your tongue. It can dramatically it can take, you know, it can take that, in, that, 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 you know, offense that you're going through and prevent it from escalating. But then lastly, as Paul says to the Ephesians, speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.25. Honest communication, don't let anger build up. Don't let anger build up. Your feeling, express it. You know, talk, communicate, speak the truth in love. It's in that passage where Paul goes on to say, you know, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath, and, but speak the truth in love. And so let's ask the Lord to just help us to grow with these. Lord God, I thank you for your word because your word is truth. Your word is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. And I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace to us. And I pray you would help us to live it out in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, even as I began, as I started speaking, I was thinking, even as I began tonight, how things can happen in life. As as I said, who wrapped up this microphone or something? You know, actually, it was very organized, wrapped up. And I thought to myself, here I am making a big deal over it. It may have been somebody who thought, wow, I really was intending to just wrap that up nice and leave it there for pastor, and I'll never do that again, the way he made a big deal over it. And if that's the case, <laughs> forgive me, because I, even that I thought, wow, why w- I was making a, 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 a kind of a big deal over it and could have caused an offense by that. you know. And so that's why I think it's good, these life lessons that we walk through. right? Anyhow, pray.